So hello everyone. We have, um, my name is Sheila Smith and I'm Senior Fellow for Japan at the Council on Foreign Relations. This is Dr. Tsunio Watanabe who is with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, is that correct? Oh yeah, but I'm not a doctor of political science. I'm a doctor of dental surgery. <laughs> so if you want your teeth fixed, just hold on <laughs> until after our discussion. So we have a very quick session today. So uh, Watanabe-san and I figured we'd have a couple of comments. We'd each ask each other a question and then we're gonna throw it open. We have a lot of knowledgeable people in the room, I can see. Um, so I don't know, Watanabe-san, why don't you start off? What are, the, the title is Abe, can he turn Japan around? So part of this is about Japan's dilemmas. Part of it is about the prime minister's status and where we see the future of Japan. Yeah, I think uh, first of all, probably somebody who saw the recent uh, news in Japan is uh, maybe Abe is uh, losing a job soon. Abe may be finished. And uh, the reason is so many scandals around him, and his uh, supporting rate was uh, dropping. But uh, I don't know, it's a good news or bad news, depends on the people. But uh, it, my feeling is uh, Abe may survive. The, his uh, supporting rate is uh, getting back. And uh, the, now, somehow, he created a new cabinet in, uh, in October, uh, no, August. And uh, that's doing a very good job, especially the foreign minister, Kono, new person. But he's a very the active, and uh, also he's a graduate of Georgetown, and a very good English speaker, and he's a very good liberal value he has. And uh, Onodera is the second Ministry of Defense. He used to be visiting fellow at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, size, and uh, he, I'm both, uh, by the way, my close friend, and I, I have big confidence over too. So the um, issue is, uh, uh, he, you know, sometimes uh, the big di difference between uh, uh, U.S. and uh, Japanese politics is a uh, presidential system and uh, uh, parliamentary cabinet system. I, I supplied uh, yesterday the, the representative Nancy Pelosi said, uh, now President Trump is understanding the difference between the presidential system and the uh, parliamentary cabinet system. Uh, I don't know. But, the big trouble is, uh, you know, the, in the parliamentary uh, cabinet system uh, has a very unknown election timing. So we don't know when the snap election is coming to. But uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, uh, the term as a uh, president uh, of LDP expires next year. And uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, prime ministership expires uh, in two years, I think. So timing is a between. And, but, uh, the, the reason, major reason Abe may survive is uh, opposition is very weak, despite of several scandals or despite of some unpopularity. Why opposition is weak? Don't ask me, because I'm a big, big supporter of opposition. <laughs> but, uh, first of all, uh, the, when the current largest opposition, Democratic Party of Japan, took position in the government in 2009, they made a big uh, mismanagement. And uh, uh, people are so frustrated. And the people's negative image over uh, opposition, the Democratic Party is uh, so, oh, so big. And also, very recently, uh, Democratic Party had a new leader, uh, Mr. Maehara, former foreign minister. He's a really uh, good, sharp guy. Uh, despite, but uh, unfortunately, he was uh, appointing to the very popular female politician, Yamao, but she had uh, some scandal dealing with a married guy, and uh, uh, she was uh, forced to resign. And then the, po the popularity to the Democratic Party is uh, very low. And uh, another possibility is uh, now rising star is uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Governor Yuriko Koike, female leader, maybe next, next decade. But very unknown. She, she, her party was a very popular in the Tokyo Metropolitan uh, election uh, and uh, trying to attract many people. But I think uh, still we don't know what kind of a policy she's going to make it, what kind of a framework uh, she's going to have it. So uh, the unknown factor in opposition. And, and uh, uh, if Mr. Abe is secures a very good policy stance and the economy stay good next year, he may be elected again in a LDP's presidential uh, one. So 
that's my prediction. Great. So I, I, I thought I'd take a slightly different take um, and sort of share with you my thoughts about what the public policy challenges for Japan are and how Mr. Abe, my, my evaluation of how Mr. Abe has done. So we all know in this room, of course, that one of the most critical uh, shapers of Japan's future is its demographics, right? The population is shrinking and aging rapidly. Uh, it, the OECD put out a report last year, if you want to take a look at it, the government of Japan has similarly looked at this problem as one of its major public policy challenges. Um, it's interesting, if you think about it, the median age in 2013 uh, was 49.5 in Japan, and the average around the rest of the OECD is 29. So it just gives you a sense that it's not just that Japanese are getting older. And again, by 2050, it looks like there's going to be about 40% of the Japanese population at 65 or older. So there's a structural challenge, I think, that no matter who leads Japan is going to have to face. Uh, this has implications, of course, to the labor market, for participation in the labor market. Prime Minister Abe has put forward a project of womenomics, trying to encourage and build the infrastructure to make it easier for Japanese women to be an active participant in the economic workforce. There's also immigration as another uh, piece of the puzzle. Japan has the lowest level of immigrant uh, uh, work, uh, workers in its uh, population, in its economy of any of the advanced industrialized economies. So there's some big questions ahead, I think, for the Japanese leadership on how they want to manage and, 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 and mitigate the impacts of the demographic impact there. Abe-san has gone about it largely through structural reforms, nothing revolutionary. Uh, on the immigration front, in addition to his womenomics project, um, he has also, uh, the Japanese government has begun to pass new laws governing immigration, guided immigration. It's nothing like what the American debate looks like here, but more people will be given what we think of as green cards, extended residence based on professional uh, need and, and the sectors within which they offer their skill set, uh, and certain sectors will even um, be allowed to stay in Japan um, per permanently. Um, but I think you're going to see managed immigration in Japan, and it may actually be accelerated depending on what the needs of the economy are going forward. So this is a huge challenge uh, for Japan. Growth, economic growth, has is largely a positive story under Mr. Abe. You've seen two years now of positive growth, albeit slow growth, 1%. Uh, much much more sustained and consistent than I think the IMF thought it was going to be, but not yet at the level at which I think Prime Minister Abe and others would like it to be. So the economic picture is mixed. Uh, there's huge structural challenges, but again, I think the Abe cabinet has been very good for growth. It has changed at least the mindset of many Japanese about the opportunities for their economy and the, and the strengths and weaknesses that they have to think about as they look forward. I think the, the other is, uh, and Sunio spoke about the, uh, the political challenges, not just for Mr. Abe, but for anybody who, uh, who wants political leadership in Japan, it is a parliamentary system. And political reforms in 1993-94 introduced, partially introduced the single member district in Japan. If you're a political scientist, you'll go, aha, I know what that means. If you're not, it just is first past the post uh, com competitive politics. It's not all national legislative seats are single member district, but a large portion of them now are. And the idea here was that sooner or later, Japan would structurally move to a two-party system where you would have a competition over public policy choices, you'd have a structurally different uh, Japanese political environment. Because that reform is halfway there, you don't yet have that competitive two-party system that Sunio is looking for um, and that many of us actually would like to see. Um, but I think what you do have now is the outcome of that is you're going to have coalition governments. It's going to be very hard for one party to govern Japan. And even the LDP, as strong as it is, as it came back from the DPJ victory um, and time in office, it is still, it needs the Komeito party in coalition to be able to sustain a, a governing majority that will allow it to, to legislate policy. So again, the political dynamics in Japan are not that easy. Abe-san is a strong, has been a strongly supported political leader, but also this story is not just about Mr. Abe, it's about the return of the LDP. I think they were out of office for three years. They learned what it, how uncomfortable it is in opposition. They have come back, I think, with a very renewed sense of purpose in terms of their governance objectives. You see in this third cabinet that I think Sunio pointed out, it's not Mr. Abe's government anymore. 
his popularity has declined because of these scandals. And I think in this third cabinet, um, you see an all LDP cabinet more than you see an Abe cabinet. And so even some of his fiercest critics, people like Noda Seiko, uh, even Konotaro has been a little critical of some of Mr. Abe's foreign policy choices. You see some of these critics being brought in, so the party is stronger. And this is a question about whether or not Mr. Abe will continue to lead the LDP when they have their election for leadership next, next um, September. The other one, and of course we've had this discussion in other panels throughout this conference, um, and that is Japan's security environment. Clearly, Northeast Asia is moving in a direction that is detrimental to Japanese strategic interests. Whether you're looking at the proliferation in North Korea, both nuclear and missile, or you're looking at the rise of Chinese maritime reach and maritime power, Japan is now being pressed in ways militarily that it has not been pressed in the past. And again, in the previous panels, we've heard a lot about this. So let me just say here that where I think Mr. Abe has perhaps made the biggest difference is in the way he has accelerated security policy reforms in Japan that will allow Japan to be more prepared for tensions, be the military to be ready in case of the, the need uh, to respond to the use of force. Uh, and he has been a, a fairly strong advocate of a debate in Japan over the revision of the Japanese constitution. Now that is not only a conversation about mili the military, but it's an important indicator that the Japanese people are ready to think more carefully about and more realistically about the way in which they respond to these military pressures in and around their country. So he has been very good uh, at that. Um, on that side, he has gotten in trouble with the public uh, periodically. He passed a, a new secrecy law early on into his tenure. The Japanese public is very sensitive to the question of state secrecy and the state being able to keep secrets. Uh, he reinterpreted the Constitution and uh, pushed for new legislation that would allow the self-defense forces to operate with the U.S. as well as other partners in the region. His support rating suffered a 9 to 10 point drop when he did that as well. So he has pushed forward some unpopular aspects of security reform. But I think the Japanese people today feel pretty, uh, con there's a pretty strong consensus uh, among the Japanese public that their country needs to be able to defend themselves adequately. If I can, Sunil, you know, let me ask you a question because you are looking forward to what comes next, right? So can Mr. Abe stay is one question. Do you think he's going to be able to stay? And if not, who do you see as the contenders for leadership in Japan next year and, and beyond? Um, the f f my question, uh, my answer is uh, Abe may stay, Abe would stay. Um, I think Abe may survive even the next year, next for the party election too. If so, probably he would like to seek uh, uh, another term of uh, uh, prime minister. And what is his goal? Uh, the first, first to survive, he really need to revive the economy. Otherwise, it's very difficult to get popular support. If he this, he survived, uh, he would touch on. Uh, uh, constitutional amendment. That is his uh, life work. Uh, Japan had a peaceful constitution, Article 9, uh, that denounced the war as a uh, tool of the resolve, the resolve the international uh, conflict. And uh, but denounce of Article, um, the, uh, the, uh, I think a change of Article 9 doesn't mean Japan would have an uh, um, ordinary military war. That's not the case. I believe really just wanted to put in uh, some legal discrepancy and uh, try to legalize uh, self-defense forces in uh, Article 9. That's safe way because uh, uh, anyway, as I uh, need to have a coalition with a Komeito party that is a uh, very pacifist and uh, don't like any radical way. So. That, that is the case. And also, Abe recently said uh, he really seeking uh, to have a uh, Japan, Korea, China, uh, trilateral summit in Japan. And if a successful, it's a time for him to visit China. He really wanted to warm up the relation, uh, cool the relation with China. That's very unusual for the conservative, but uh, Abe needed because uh, Abe has a lot of a liberal uh, faction uh, within the party, and also Abe uh, has uh, the pro-China coalition partner, Kometo. So do you have a question for me, or should, oh, we, yeah. or should have, we open it? Yeah, well, before that, uh, I'm very curious. You're, you're confident 
with uh, Abe either surviving or not? If not, uh, who's gonna be? Or you still have uh, some trust for the Japan's opposition, especially DPJ or any other uh, person to create an uh, alternative? Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, so I, it's, 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 I'm not sure uh, whether Abe is going to survive next September or not. And I think a lot of this will depend on several issues that are coming up between now and then. Um, he has, after the reshuffle of the cabinet to what I call the all LDP cabinet, um, his support rating has come up three or four points. So there's some initial positive bounce. I think another, the, one of the issues that is going to help him is obviously the North Korea issue. Uh, it is his strength uh, on the security side, and a strong Japan is, is very much what he's putting forward, and he's been very effective, I think, in both diplomatic overtures to the United States, to the United Nations, to the European countries, and, and, and elsewhere, uh, but he's also quite fixed on making sure that the country is ready to be defended, so that will help him. I think what will be a question that could harm him, and uh, he can't help this, but your consumption tax is due to be uh, uh, lifted again, uh, raised again next year. This is something that he put off once. He held a snap election uh, to postpone that decision until the, the economy got some, some bounce, but he's gonna have to confront that because it's on the, it's on the books, right, for next year. So that's a tricky issue, and for the no, no, no country, no voter likes a tax increase. <laughs> it's a hard thing to go to the polls with, and the Japanese voters are not the exception. So I'm not sure, I'm maybe not as confident as you are that he's gonna slide into September 2018 with, with no uh, pushback. You asked me about the, Demo the Democratic Party just on the oppositions. I agree with you. I won't go on, but I agree with you. I don't think there's a viable opposition party at the moment. So I think this is really a, a, a question of, is it Mr. Abe or is it somebody else in the LDP that leads the party? But I don't see uh, an opposition party claiming the, the government from the LDP Komeito coalition. I had the good fortune to meet uh, the governor uh, of Tokyo, uh, Yuri. Y Yuri uh, to remember the name. Anyway, Eureka, Eureka. She's a formidable uh, challenger because she has a uh, background in defense, uh, former defense secretary, and also global background. Uh, she was educated in Cairo, mm -hmm. and that is also a great plus, you know. But uh, uh, the way I see is uh, maybe she doesn't have uh, that much uh, chance, but uh, let's think about the possibility that if she wins, how it would transform the Japanese society, a women leader. Uh, a question for both of you. Uh, in the Western media and ac academia, they tend to focus on Japanese foreign policy and less so on domestic politics and the economy. Is there any foreign policy victory for Prime Minister Abe that the voters would look at over domestic economic issues? And what would that foreign policy victory actually be, especially related to security? Uh, Aichi Kadahara from the Ministry of Defense. But I have a question as a student of Japan's foreign and security policy uh, for both of you. I find it difficult to understand Japan's policy toward Russia. Uh, what is your evaluation of Japan's policy toward Russia? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, given recent events, the, uh, even the popular opinion in Japan seems to be toward a stronger uh, defense capability. Uh, I lived in Japan 40 years ago and after World War II, and of course the popular feeling toward military was very negative. The, the uh, self-defense forces didn't have much prestige. How, has that changed now? Will the military be able to recruit top people as we can in the United States? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, okay, many good questions. Uh, I'm going to the very difficult one, uh, the Professor Katahara's question, <laughs> Japan's policy toward Russia. It's uh, puzzling. The reason is that uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Abe is one of a few leaders who have a closer relation with the President P Putin. So, um, and, uh, but uh, it seems to me uh, Japan and Russia has a very serious territorial issue, uh, Japan called the Northern Territory, Kuril Islands. And, uh, and uh, Japan really expects Putin to do some, the making a big advance uh, development for the territorial issue. But uh, uh, the observer says that it will be very difficult because the nationalistic uh, Putin cannot concede too much to the their own constituency, especially the facing election again. So 
maybe some the different motivation for a to approach. That is a, the considering a power balance. Uh, that's clearly the China. Uh, Russia uh, somehow utilized Japan as a kind of a hedge against China. Russia, China enjoy the closer relation, but too much depends on the China is uh, risky. And Japan probably the afraid of a too much closer uh, the relation between Russia and China. That's not so good thing. So uh, Russia is uh, somehow good hedge for Abe to think about it. But uh, you know, politically, Abe cannot say because uh, people's expectation of Abe is a recovered uh, territorial dispute. So th that is a question, the one question. And uh, uh, I pick up uh, Koike Yuriko, uh, the metropolitan governor. I personally know very well, too. She's, uh, she's background is uh, it's very interesting, as you pointed out, that the graduate of uh, uh, the University of Cairo. So she's a very realist, unlike Japanese realist. She's a real realist in uh, Middle East policy. So that means uh, she has been very successful to winning a position in a battle. But uh, she's not so good at the peace moment. Not tested the some architecture of a society, of a uh, political reform. That's big test. We don't know. And what kind of a good uh, wisdom to Koike? So far, we don't know because Koike is just a metropolitan government governor and doesn't have any political organization. One possibility is uh, Aki Nagashima, for, former uh, senior defense ministry, may join Koike. By the way, Aki Nagashima used to be the fellow at the Council on the Foreign Relations. So that leaves me with the foreign policy issue that plays well domestically, and then Mark's question about the military. Um, I think the self def I'll, I'll go in the reverse order. Mark, I think the, the self-defense forces today are much more widely respected and appreciated and valued by the Japanese public than perhaps three decades ago. And there's several reasons for this. One is, of course, that you have, gener you have generational change in Japan. So the stigma about wearing the uniform has, it has basically dissipated. Um, young, bright men and women are going into the self-defense forces, especially the Navy and the Air Force, which of course are, are much more um, uh, respected in terms of their capabilities and the requirements, et cetera. There's movies being made about, you know, uh, Top Gun kind of movies that have also introduced more of the uniform services into the popular culture. I think the other piece, of course, is obviously in 2011, um, the March 11 disaster, triple disasters, the self-defense forces were the first responders. The police and the fire, fire departments were also there, of course, but the, but the Japanese military really went into that disaster as the face of Japan. And when you were watching them operate in that capacity, social media was full of thank yous to them. Uh, the polling, the opinion, the data from polling right after that, but not the, uh, that was sustained for years, has been that they are one of the most respected institutions of Japanese government. So I think you, they have demonstrated to the Japanese public that their their public interest is their interest, right? So that they have done a very good job there. Um, it's also, I mean, to link it to my comment about threat perception in Japan, um, the Japanese public looks to the self-defense force now to be able to defend them against North Korea, against an encroaching China, uh, along with the alliance and the U.S. military uh, as partners. So the expectation on them is also greater um, than it's ever been before. On the, the, the domestic issue that affects foreign policy the most, I would go to North Korea first and foremost, A, because of the threat, and the missile launches, the Japanese threat, public threat perception has been elevated by that. But also remember the issue of the Japanese abductees that were abducted by the North Korean regime. Uh, Prime Minister Abe, when he was cabinet secretary, cut his teeth on that issue when he was uh, working for Mr. Koizumi, who went to Pyongyang to attempt to negotiate with Kim Jong-un's father, uh, Kim Jong-il. Um, and so for the Japanese public, North Korea is a threat not only because of the missiles, but also because of the internal impact they had and the abductions of Japanese citizens. And so I think that's a very potent political issue for the Japanese. Um, but I think the other issue is the US-Japan alliance and Trump. And we didn't talk about it much, and I was thinking we were going to get a question, but we didn't. Um, but Mr. Abe's astute political <laughs> outreach to our president-elect was risky. 
It was very risky, frankly, uh, but it paid off in the end. And I think it matters. It, 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 it is one piece of the puzzle in the domestic political debate in Japan that he has successfully, let's not say tamed Mr. Trump, but he has transformed Mr. Trump into an ally of Japan, a friend of Japan. And if you think about it, um, normally, if a North Korean missile was launched early on in a new presidential campaign, it would be the ROK-US alliance that would be first and foremost, but it's not. It's been the US-Japan alliance and Mr. Abe and Mr. Trump that have defined the collective response. Now, part of that is serendipity, because South Korea didn't have a strong president at the time, um, but I think he's had a pretty substantial role in making sure that the alliance is strong and steady, and that, of course, has been very welcome among the, the Japanese public. The only other issue, and I'll say one minute because I agree with Tunio on the Russia, uh, his Russia response, but I think the Russia uh, island dispute has a little bit of leg room in the Japanese public, not anything near as much as the US-Japan alliance or North Korea, but Mr. Abe does have to be careful in how he approaches the negotiations with the Russians. There is some underlying sentiment here of resentment towards the Russians because of the way they behaved after World War II, and Mr. Abe will have to be careful with that. So on that note, I think we have overstayed our welcome. I apologize. There's people waiting to take the, take the stage, but thank you all for coming, and thank you, Tsunio. Oh, do you have a point? One, one, one more. All right. Sorry, no, no, go ahead. One, one more secret talk, with, uh, off the record talk, is uh, when uh, Prime Minister Abe was uh, seeing uh, uh, the uh, President-elect Trump last December, my friend, um, Japanese-American, uh, worked closely. And, uh, uh, he's a friend of uh, Jared Kushner, and uh, asked my advice seriously. And uh, my message is: uh, make uh, the concentrate on uh, human but human relation between Abe and Trump. Don't talk about a policy issue. Never talked about it. So that was a success. There you go. Thank you all very much.